W. Hardy Hendren invented new operations to correct congenital urological malformations. In a career spanning more than six decades, he transformed the lives of children who would have died of renal failure, live in diapers, or with a stoma. Instead, they lead normal lives, have children, and raise families. He trained a generation of leaders in pediatric surgery at the Massachusetts General Hospital and the Children's Hospital in Boston. Born in New Orleans and raised in Kansas City, Hardy knew as a child he wanted to be a surgeon. Friends of his family who were surgeons took the boy to the hospital to watch surgical operations. He was in high school in Virginia when America entered World War II. After only one semester at Dartmouth, he enlisted in the Navy as an air cadet and earned his aviator's wings. Back in Kansas City after the war, Hardy courted Eleanor McKenna. On their first date, he made the most important decision of his life. And as I was driving her home, I remember driving up to the corner of West 58th Street, where my mother and father lived, and Ward Parkway. And I stopped and I said, you're the girl I'm going to marry. And what do you suppose she did? <laughs> She laughed. She laughed. And I said, you wait and see. They eloped three months later. He went to Dartmouth and spent the first two years of medical school there before completing his degree in medicine at Harvard. At Harvard, a rotation with Robert E. Gross, chief of surgery at the Children's Hospital, inspired him to go into pediatric surgery. And pediatric surgery dealt with such a variety of different things that it just beckoned you, you uh, to come and see something of this. And so I was very fortunate and had a, a month with Dr. Gross, and uh, that pretty much decided that that's what I wanted to do. He trained in surgery at the Massachusetts General Hospital under Edwin Churchill, including two years at the Children's Hospital under Dr. Gross. After completing his residency at the MGH, Dr. Gross called Hardy and offered him a job back at the Children's Hospital. I decided to do that, but I told him I did not want to skip his chief residency, that I would do that first. And he said, well, you, you've already done a chief residency with Dr. Churchill. I said, I know, but I'd like to have the ch chief residency here at the Children's. And he said, OK, you, you can do that. And so that's what I did. As Hardy's career developed, his relationship with Dr. Gross became troubled. His secretary said that you better be careful. You did more cases last month than Dr. Gross did. And I said, well, for heaven's sakes, don't call that to his attention. And her answer to that was, he knows exactly how many cases everybody does every month. I had two cases and I came in to operate. My name was crossed off the board with a red chalk. And I asked, oh, the ch chief of anesthesia, Bob Smith, asked me why I canceled my cases and didn't uh, tell them. I said, Bob, I don't know what you're talking about. And the head nurse came out and said, Dr. Gross, cancel those cases. And so I went around to see Dr. Gross. And I stood there fully for five minutes 
before he even acknowledged my being in the room with him. And I asked him, what, what is this all about? And he said, you're doing too much. I said, Dr. Gross, I've been away on vacation for several days to Kansas City. How could I be doing too much? He said, you're doing too much. And um, I would suggest you go down the street and um, find a, an office someplace and we'll see how things work out. So I went to see Dr. Churchill that day. Dr. Churchill said, Hardy, Bob will never let a good young man come up underneath him. It's just not in the cards. And so I want you to come here to the MGH and start pediatric surgery here, see what you can do. And so that's what I did. I moved out of the children's that day and went to the MGH. Once he was at the MGH, Hardy was immediately busy, taking call every day. He saw children with urological problems, an interest he developed from his years at the children's hospital. And I would go through all these records, some of which were like this, with various and sundry things, ilia loops, and so forth. And uh, the more I got into this, the more I would see could be done differently. He recalls his first case of mega ureter. I, I did some half-baked thing, and it didn't work. And so I put in a temporary tube, sent him off to Florida, and meanwhile moved myself away from children's and back to the MGH. And what I did was took down the whole distal ureter, trimmed it, re-implanted it so it wouldn't reflux, and it did beautifully. Before long, I had enough to write a paper on the subject. And so I put it on to the AUA as a paper to be given in Florida at the AUA meeting. And Jim Glenn, who was then the chairman of urology at Duke, made a comment. He was very suspicious that I was a charlatan and that I was not presenting before and after of the same patient. Dr. Hendren's operations were adopted first in England and France before they became accepted practice in the U.S. He never shrank from difficult surgery. He operated on more than 200 cases of cloaca malformations, some operations lasting 24 hours. His stamina and perseverance in the operating room earned him the nickname Hardly Human. I never tackle something just because it's there. I tackle something if it's sensible to do. And frequently, it's a redo case that somebody else has done in a half-baked fashion. And uh, 
if I think it can be done better, I just do it. Dr. Hendren remembers some difficult operations with Dr. Gross. But he, he would have times that he would be over his head. And at a time like that, he would sometimes give up and walk away and tell you to close. And so you can't do that in surgery. You can't abandon a patient because the patient is presenting you with some very difficult task to do. And I never felt belittled by the hardly human nickname that never bothered me. Because what really was important was that you do a good job of the operation and that you never walk away from the pa pa patient knowing that you have not done it well. And what you have to do in those circumstances is eat some crow and do it again. Harvard surgeon Joseph Vacanti trained with Dr. Hendren's service as a resident at the MGH and was his first chief resident at the Children's Hospital. But I guess I came to learn of his technical abilities directly in the operating room. And he, his, his uh, own scrub nurse, Doc, uh, Dorothy Enos, and he worked seamlessly no matter the complexity of any patient in any situation. In fact, I came to look at it as almost silent ballet or poetry in motion. They were so fluid in their, in their movements. After that experience, I decided that he would be the surgeon that I would most try to model as I learned the craft of surgery. Well established at the MGH, late one evening, Hardy received a phone call. The voice was very familiar, but one that he had not heard for years. And about 10.30 one night, the telephone rang. Hello, Hardy, this is Dr. Bob Gross. <laughs> I thought I was having a nightmare. I got out of bed, and the elder said, what are you doing standing up? <laughs> in, in the middle of the night, I, I'm standing up, and she's wondering, what, what is he doing, go, going bonkers? And <clears throat> the voice went on, I'm getting the Bigelow Medal next week and I would appreciate it if I could have you uh, come with me and um, do my slides for me. And I said, well, I'd be happy to. Go to John Allen and get a new projector. Have an extra extension cord with you, have an extra bulb with you in case a bulb gets blown, and pick me up at my office at four o'clock in the afternoon, Wednesday, whatever it was, people started coming in at about six o'clock. And when they saw 
me standing there with Robert Gross. They couldn't understand what it was all about. Kenny Welch walked up and he said to me, here's a hundred dollar bill and I'll give you this if you'll drop his slides. <laughs> a final reconciliation came a few years later at the American Surgical Association meeting where Hardy had a paper. Dr. Gross, who was there at the meeting, told Hardy that he would like to discuss his paper at the meeting. Dr. Gross made some very nice remarks about the paper and what a great feeling it was to get, be at the end of a surgical career and see your young people gaining ahead of where you were at one time. And I am reminded of the words of Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> I'm sitting there, <laughs> not knowing what was about to come. A good teacher will be outshined by a brilliant student. And at the moment he gave that, the entire American surgical rose. I've never seen that happen before or since. Well, Francis Moore is the person that walked up behind me in the egress from the auditorium. And he said, Hardy, you may have thought that Bob was discussing your paper, but that's not what he was doing. He was giving you a public apology for what he did to you years ago. I think his spirit of innovation, in spite of the heavy criticism from uh, the conventional world of opinion leaders, his determination to make things better for children that were afflicted with terrible diseases, some of which uh, would ultimately prove fatal. So his reconstructive approach was really a paradigm shift and it required an enormous amount of focus and um, determination in spite of criticism. In summary, I would say that it has been a privilege to be associated with Dr. Hendren. It has also been very rewarding to see that he is now recognized for all of the innovations that he either brought to the world of surgery and children himself or that he sponsored so that others could innovate under his tutelage and direction.